Okay. Uh, so for the past several months, I've been writing a linker in Rust. The linker is called WILD, which is a recursive acronym, which stands for Wild, in Wild Incremental Linker. I'll start by giving a high-level overview of what a linker does, talk about some motivations for why I'm writing a linker, then go into some more details about some of the weird things that linkers need to handle. I'll talk about some of the tools and techniques that I use for debugging a linker, and go through some of the de details of how the linker is implemented, talk about the current status and performance of the linker, and then talk about how all of this can be used to speed up Rust compile times. <coughs> At a high level, a linker's job is to take multiple compiler outputs and merge them together into a single binary. But as we'll see, some of the details make this a lot more complicated than it might at first sound. First of all, why another linker? There's already four existing link open source linkers available on Linux, GNU LD, Gold, LLD, and Mold. So why write another one? My main motivation is to speed up Rust compile times, in particular incremental compilation times. With the right settings and a project that's not too large, Rust compile times are currently actually pretty good, I find. Uh, however, as the size of your code base, and in particular the size of your dependencies grows, it can start to become quite substantial. For, for incremental builds, linking can often be the slowest step because it's done from scratch each time. And this is where incremental linking can help by avoiding the need to repeat a lot of that work every time you build. Tighter integration can also, tighter integration between the linker and Rust-C also has the potential to speed up cold builds, which I'll talk about later. The input to the linker uh, is composed of many, object files are composed of many sections, and they contain not only executable code, but also read-only data, read-write data, and read-write zero-initialized data. The last of these is special in that because it's all zeros, it doesn't need to take up any space in the file, but the linker still needs to lay it out. There are also many specialized section types that the linker needs to handle specially or generate in many cases, including the global offset table, which contains pointers to symbols that are not resolved until runtime. The procedure linkage table, which contains little bits of machine code that are generated by the linker and jump to functions via the global offset table. Symbol tables, which are used for debugging and backtraces. And dynamic symbol tables, which are used for looking up symbols at runtime if you're using shared objects. <coughs> Each input file is composed of many sections. These sections, depending on compiler settings, these sections can contain many functions or variables. However, more commonly these days, there, there's one function or one section per, one, one function or one variable per section. This allows the linker to form a garbage collection phase where it starts from the entry point to your program and traverses the graph to find out what is and isn't used. So in this diagram, we can see unused one and unused two aren't reachable from start, and so the linker can throw them away. And they don't need to go into the final binary. The green squares are sections, each containing a single function, in this case, and the, the blue arrows are Relocations. A relocation is an instruction to the linker to place an address at a particular offset within a section when it writes that section to the output file. <coughs> ELF files on Linux have many kinds of relocations, around about, up to about 40. Uh, I'll only go through, briefly go through a few of those that are particularly interesting. So thread locals in Rust can be declared using the thread local macro, which means each thread then gets a separate copy of the variable. There are four different access models on, on for thread locals on Linux. The global dynamic is the most general and also the slowest. It requires a function call every time the thread local is accessed. This access model is used if you've got something like a, a dynamically loaded shared object, such, a, as, such as a plugin, uh, and it's accessing a, a thread local that is declared outside of that plugin. Local dynamic's a little bit faster and is used if the plugin is accessing a thread local that it declared. Initial exec applies to the main binary and all of its shared objects that it depends on. And then local exec applies only to the main binary. It's by far the fastest, and you can access thread locals with one instruction per, per access. So the linker needs to be able to handle all of these different kinds of access models. Additionally, because the compiler, when it's compiling the code, particularly if it's a, a library like libc, it doesn't know whether that code is going to go into a, into a shared object or into an into a executable binary. And so pessimistically, it often compiles using the global dynamic model. However, the linker has a little bit more information when it's linking. It knows what's going into the binary and what kind of binary it is. And so it, it also has the job of transforming between these models. So it can transform from global dynamic all the way down to local exec if that applies. <coughs> Another interesting feature of the linkers have to deal with is, is ifunks. These are a GNU extension, 
which allow you to have several versions of a function and a resolver which picks which one to use. Uh, so these resolvers get called at startup by glibc and passed information about the features supported by the current CPU. They then return a pointer to the selected implementation, which is put into an entry in the global offset table and then used for all calls to that function at runtime. The linker needs to write relocations for all these so that glibc can find them at startup. An interesting aside is that the recent XZ backdoor used an ifunc resolver in order to install the backdoor before the global offset table was made read-only. But more commonly, they're used to provide faster versions of functions like memcopy. Exception frames are used at runtime for stack unwinding and backtraces in case your code panics. They're related to debug info, but more limited. I each function in your binary needs to have frame information uh, unfortunately, the linker puts all of this frame information into, the, into a single section, and so the linker has to uh, unpack all of this and discard any frame information that isn't, that uh, belongs to functions that were discarded by the garbage collection phase. The linker also needs to build a binary search index so that the uh, runtime can find the appropriate frame information for an arbitrary address at runtime. <coughs> there are many more things that the linker needs to be able to handle such as string merging, where you have multiple strings, particularly common with C, where you've got header files. Uh, needs to be, these strings need to be deduplicated. Uh, common symbols are a feature that came from Fortran and for some reason was ported to C. Uh, they're hardly ever used, but glibc does use them a little bit, so you need to implement them. They're zero initialized and can be declared multiple times with different sizes, and the linker needs to find this one with the maximum size and use that. Custom sections, if you have multiple custom sections, if you have multiple inputs with custom sections with the same name, they need to be merged together into a single section in the output. And the linker also needs to declare start and stop symbols, which allow the user code to find everything that is in this section at runtime. Weak symbols with the same name can, weak symbols can be overridden by strong symbols with the same name. And it's also okay for weak symbols to have no definition, in which case they're resolved to zero or the undefined symbol. Archives are a way of packing multiple objects into a single file. Very strangely, however, linkers need to treat objects within archives differently than objects not in archives. Specifically, an object in an archive needs to be ignored unless it defines a symbol that a previous input listed as undeclared. Another annoying thing about archives is that it's, they're a really old format, and so they only guarantee two-byte alignment of the files within them. So that means the linker needs to be able to handle inputs that aren't 64-bit aligned. <coughs> When the linker gets something wrong, it can be pretty hard to work out what the problem is. Two really useful tools for this are objdump and readalc, which you can use to examine both the input files and the output file. GDB, the debugger, is useful for stepping through the program to see where it's getting something wrong. Usually you're just looking at the assembly code because that's what the linker is dealing with. I'll usually take the output from the system linker, GNU LD, and use that as a reference. So I'll step through both the output from my linker and the output from GNU LD in parallel and see where they diverge. Whenever I'm using GDB, I'm almost always using it via Mozilla's RR, which is a replay debugger, and it's incredibly useful uh, because it lets you step not only forwards but backwards. And so I can run the program to the point where it sig faults and then step back to, to figure out how it got there and what went wrong. I've also been working on a tool to diff ELF files, uh, which can allow me to figure out what are the significant differences between two files, even though they have completely different layout. <coughs> Most phases of the linker make heavy use of threading, and this is mostly done by Rayon's parita. However, there are two, a couple of graph algorithms in the linker, specifically the algorithm for determining which archive entries need to be used, and the garbage collection algorithm are both graph algorithms. And these don't fit very well into Rayon, so they're more of a manual threading implementation there. <coughs> the linker memory maps all of the input files as well as the output file. This means that it's crucial that the input files not change while the linker's running, otherwise we'll get undefined behavior likely resulting in a crash. All the other, link, the other linkers do this as well. It's necessary in order to get best performance. Uh, and it's, I find it very unfortunate that Linux doesn't provide a way to safely memory map files. <coughs> the linker avoids heap allocation as much as possible, often allocating large blocks of memory that it then splits up and allows each thread to work on parts separately. Uh, it borrows stuff wherever possible. So for example, the hash map that lets you look up symbols by name borrows, rather than heap allocating each symbol name, it just borrows the names from the input files. Each stage that runs borrows the outputs of the previous stages, and Rust scoped threads pro have proved super valuable for making this work safely. <coughs> the, 
the linker is currently work only works for Linux x86 only. Uh, static linking works, well I do have to explain that in future. Static linking works reasonably well. Uh, I've tested with Muscle and GLibC, works with non-relocatable and position independent outputs, stack unwinding works. Dynamic linking I just got working just the other day with trivial with a trivial binary, um, but it, there's still more to do before it works in general. And output to shared objects such as proc macros is still a work in progress. I also don't yet support debug info. <coughs> I've only done limited benchmarking of the linker so far, uh, but this, this table shows the times to link an 80 megabyte statically linked non-relocatable binary with no debug info. Uh, as you can see, GNU-LD takes about 12 seconds. That's the default linker on most Linux distributions. Um, and then we get all the way down to the LLD, mold, and wild, uh, which are less than a second. <coughs> so wild is doing fairly well there, although wild is also by far the least mature of the linkers. And as I implement new features and bug fixes, it's possible that time could increase, but I'm gonna try as hard as I can to keep it where it is if possible. And I have tried to make this test as fair as I can by only using features that all the linkers support for this benchmark. <coughs> so I haven't yet started work on incremental linking, but that is what the I stands for, so I am somewhat committed. Uh, the idea of incremental linking is to avoid repeating uh, the work each time you do a build, build, rebuild. So if you've only added a print statement to one function, you shouldn't need to relink your entire binary. This is definitely not intended for development purposes, where you would want to have a reproducible output <coughs> uh, but for, for rapid development, it's, it's probably pretty, should hopefully be, be good. So the output won't be a bit identical, and it'll also be slightly larger than it would be if you linked normally, because we need to allow extra space in the sections for them to grow as you make edits. <coughs> the idea is that the linker will keep track of where everything is, and if you make an edit, then it'll be able to go back and change just what's needed without having to redo everything. <coughs> One area where I'm especially excited for the, having a linker written in Rust is potential for closer integration with, Rust, with the Rust compiler. This could either take the form of building the linker into the Rust compiler or loading part of the Rust compiler into the linker as a, some kind of, via some plug-in mechanism. Either way, what this would allow would be to move parts of compilation to link time uh, in an optional way. So specifically code gen, monomorphization, and inlining, which I'll talk about on the next three slides. <coughs> So code gen is where the compiler takes your code and emits machine code that can be executed on the processor. Uh, it's also where most of the optimizations happen, and it's one of the more expensive parts of compilation. The idea behind moving it to the linker would be that we can take advantage of the linker's garbage collection, which knows which parts of the code are and aren't used. And so this would allow us to avoid doing code gen for code that doesn't actually need to go into the binary, which can be quite a bit in some cases, because you've often got dependencies that you're only using part of the dependency, not the whole thing. Uh, even if you've got feature flags, there'll often be bits that aren't being used. And for example, debug impuls, there's lots of debug impuls all throughout your code and you're probably not using most of them. But you don't necessarily want to get rid of them. Uh, caching would obviously also be needed here. <coughs> Monomorphization is where the compiler takes a generic function and substitutes concrete types. For example, converting BEC T push to BEC U32 push. Each code gen unit that calls BEC U32 push repeats its monomorphization, and more importantly, it repeats the code gen associated with it. So the idea of moving this to, to link time would be that we could make sure that we only did that monomorphization in code gen once. <coughs> this, this slide shows the reason why I think it would be useful to move inlining to link time. So suppose we have a workspace with several crates, and we are uh, making edits to the crate A, and then rebuilding our binary. If we need to rebuild A, rebuild D, rebuild our binary, and then relink. <coughs> if we're only making changes to the implementation in A, it'd be nice if we could just recompile A and then relink. Uh, but at the moment, we can't because there could be a function in D that inlines the function we just edited in A. And so we need to recompile D. However, if we move the inline into the linker, then we can just recompile A and then relink. And we'd redo the inlining that was necessary when we, when we uh, linked, but we wouldn't need to run the compiler on D. And you might think this doesn't save much, but there's actually a lot that when we invoke the Rust compiler on D, it does a lot of work. It needs to parse all the input files, run all the procedural macros. Uh, even with incremental compilation, we may need to go over and figure out what's changed and what hasn't, all just so that we can re-inline that one function, whereas the linker can probably do that a lot quicker. So in summary, incremental builds can be sped up by incremental linking and deferring inlining to link time. And cold builds can be sped up by deferring code gen to link time and deferring monomorphization to link time. So I think having a linker written in Rust has great potential for speeding up Rust compile times. 
I'd like to finish by saying a big thank you to all of my GitHub sponsors for making it possible for me to work on this full time. Thank you, and do you have any questions? <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'll just open with one question. What's like the mo what's the most annoying thing that you would like to remove from the job of a linker to make your life easier while implementing one? Uh, I think there's certain small things that I would like to change about some of the input formats. Uh, yeah. there's, there's bits of information that I don't know until inconvenient times. Like I don't know about what custom sections there are mm -hmm. at the time when I'm assigning symbol names. So I need to do that after the fact. Just sort of, it, some of the yeah. ordering becomes trick, tricky. Is, is there any movement in the space on like changing these things or alternative formats or something like that? I don't, I don't think so, not at this stage. Okay. I mean, I could experiment and if I can show enough of a benefit, then most likely I wouldn't come up with a whole new format. It would just be a, you know, a special kind of alpha yeah. where I could know this stuff in advance. And if I see that I've got that, I can maybe take advantage of it, but okay. I don't know. Cool. Any other questions, please just come up. Hold it for you. Oh. Both microphones? Yes. Both. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, for the incremental part of your uh, linker, I had a similar incremental problem before where like, I realized that if I want to do it incremental at like the function level or like at the like, individual item level, it would be more costly to serialize and deserialize than any of the benefits that uh, the incremental stuff will bring. But, like, how? Would you approach your incremental, um, the, the incremental part of your code without the other um, stuff becoming an issue? Yeah, great question. Uh, so my plan there is not to serialize and deserialize, but just to end map stuff. So I would have some kind of persistent map on disk uh, where, yeah. Well, the so so I'd map. I would have maps that I would store on disk, and then I would I wouldn't deserialize them. I just end map them. Oh, so then okay. I would just be looking up a hash. Doing a hash and looking up into that end map, into that end mapped data structure. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, you mentioned an elf diffuser. Any more details on that? Because that'd be I really mean, cool. It's, it's only something I've I've done a lot of thinking about what I want, and I've written some stuff. At the moment, I'm mostly just diffing headers and various other things like oh. that. Um, it has proven useful so far for finding a number of bugs, but um, my eventual plan is to. Uh, disassemble all the functions, and then ignore the exact addresses of things, but just look at what what symbol is this call function pointing at, and effectively disassemble everything, and then just see what is different. Um, yeah. So is it's this got, going it's to turn into a yak shape? It's got a long way to go for it's useful, but <laughs> <laughs> it's already proven useful so far, so yeah. we'll see. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, uh, if you have more uses for it, I'd well, I, I, I work with, uh, with ROMs a lot of work, and so diffing helps between ROM iterations is a right. really tricky problem that we constantly butt our heads against, so, mm. yeah. Awesome. Any other questions? Uh, hi. Um, what is your testing strategy in order to ensure that the correctness of uh, the linker, particularly as, uh, as you will be adding uh, new functionalities? So I have a bunch of programs that I compile and I link them with the, rate, with the system linker and then run them and make sure that they get the expected output, and then I do the same with my linker. And okay, so based on some existing uh, mapping? Sorry? S some existing mapping of uh, uh, linkers? So I, I'm, I have a bunch of tests to test to make sure linking works correctly, and I first of all run those with the system linker mm -hmm. to make sure yep. that the test is correct, and then run them with my linker to make sure that Thank you. they pass there as well. <coughs> so just running programs. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, if not, then thank you very much, David.